looking at challenge-based coaching. Um, I'm going to run through a presentation here. I have no idea how long this takes, other than the fact that it will not take an hour. It's not, it may be short of half an hour, who knows? And then uh, we'll, we'll ask for questions. If you, at any stage, think, look, I've had enough, you just log off and, and that's it. You don't even have to stay for questions. If you think you've got a couple of wee bits and pieces that you want to take from it, that's grand. Like any presentation, usually if I'm at anything, I go away maybe after an hour and I've got a couple of things. That's it. Somebody else might go with five things. Somebody else go with 10. Somebody else will go with nothing. So it's really up to you and what your situation is at your club or county. So challenge-based coaching. Let's see where it takes us. So I hope you can all see this. Um, the idea is we're trying to get players to take more ownership. And then there's a word here, prompt, that it'll come up lots of times about we want to prompt. We're going to prompt things rather than step in and do a lot of instruction. And so if you see prompt through this, um, just pay attention to it each time. So we're going to start with a bit of a challenge, a starter challenge for you. Nothing to do with sport whatsoever. Nothing to do with sport. So if you have seen this challenge, um, you're obviously not going to be able to discuss it with anybody else. If you haven't, Follow the instructions on it. Don't write down anything. Don't take a screenshot, etc. Just try it out and see what comes of it. So how do we read? Okay, so these nine ships, when I show them, I'll give you 15 seconds and then I'll change the screen. So no notes. Try it just having a look. There you go. So that's about us there and there. So there's four ships. What I'd like you to do is see if you can write down the four numbers that match those four ships. Now, we're obviously not going to put this up in a chat box and if people come in on it, this is just an exercise to let you see whether it's easy or difficult. So if I have 150 people on here, my reckoning is unless you've seen this before, the vast majority of people will find that extremely difficult to do, extremely difficult to do, and will just give up on it. And my point is this, my point is not to do with that particular thing. My point is, is this the way players feel when we give instructions? In other words, do we run through stuff that we understand really well, um, and we foist it on them, and we expect them to know it, and it's coming at them that fast. There's a 15 second thing. There's this, there's that, there's the other. And whatever happens in all of that, there are people getting lost. And if you're losing more people than you're getting, then the problem could be ours. So is this the way players feel? So if you were sitting there and you got those four shapes and you had no idea, well, you could be the player who's listening to instructions and you still at the end of it have no idea. So that's a we push on here to see what happens. Few questions. Do we expect too much too soon? In other words, do we like the idea of, you know, coming up with catchphrases and picking up on things like learning is messy and learning takes time and learning is ugly, etc. And then those are all fine. Those are all little sound bites. And then all of a sudden you go to the pitch and you expect learning to happen now. So got to learn now, got to learn now. How, how, how come you didn't learn that? So if you're going to, I don't mean trot out, but if you're going to adhere to those types of things, then you've got to understand that learning does take ages and ages to happen. You'll be lucky with a few who learn something really quickly. And even then, it could be something that's just a performance indicator. They're doing it at the time. If you did it next Tuesday without prompting them again, there's prompt, then they've forgotten it. So a question to keep in your head. Second one. Are we fascinated by time limits? So we need this by this time. We need this. I give you 15 seconds to do that. That was just pulled out of the air, 15 seconds. I could have said 10, 30, whatever. Are we fascinated by, you've got to have it done by this time? Sometimes that works. A lot of the time, we really don't need time limits as such. 
you know, the, the last two questions are more important for me. They're probably not ones that we're used to. This one here about being duped by the few who answer our questions. I suppose with, with being a teacher for 35 years, this is the sort of thing that the trap that we fell into as teachers. And sometimes we fall into those coaches. So we ask a question and we've got a squad in front of us and two, three answer. And we take that as sort of affirmation that the message has got through. There it is. And what you're not looking for is you can't see the other faces that are as you turn them away to go to start playing again. The other faces that are going, what, what, what happened there? You know, so we as coaches just get a bit carried away with the fact that we get, oh, there's somebody who got the answer. They got the answer, got the answer. I remember in class, it'd be like the people who have scored A's and you get this sort of false confidence of, oh, there's an A in the class. There are two or three A's in the class. Where are the rest? Where are the rest? So don't get duped by the few who answer questions. Look deeper than that. And this last one, again, there's prompts in it. It'll sound a wee bit off the wall, but uh, let me explain it to you this way. If we're seeing prompts as last resorts rather than building blocks, that's a bit woolly. So I'll give you an example. You're in an interview situation. So, I, so I've been in lots of interview situations, both as an interviewee and as an interviewer. So let's take the interviewee. You're there as an interviewee and you want, there's this thing in you that if you have to ask a question and you have to ask for clarification in the question that they ask, um, it's it's a weakness. It's a weakness. A prompt is a it's a last resort. I don't want to ask for a prompt, etc. Worse still is on the other side. So you've got the interviewers. They're the the coaches as such. They're the people who are doing the interviewing, and the interviewing in a committee is summing up afterwards when a candidate is left, and somebody happens to say, "Well, you know, he needed a few prompts here and there," and you're thinking, "What?" Maybe the questions were rubbish. That's why you needed a few prompts. So the same happens when we have to think about prompts in terms of prompting players and players being prompted to develop their learning are really good building blocks. They're not last resorts. They're not a sign of weakness. So we're back to a thing that you did earlier. So here's a prompt. You may not see it as a prompt at the minute. Some of you might see it as a prompt. Maybe with the next bit, you'll see it as a prompt. So have a look and see, there's your four shapes. Can you do anything with those four shapes and those numbers? Now we may get to the stage where some people are going, got it, I can see it, I can see it. Some others not, who knows? So let's put you out of your misery in this respect. So a four goes in there because that's the shape in the there that the four is in at the minute. There's where the six is. There's the five right in the center with square around it. There's a three. So four, six, five, three. You may be one of the ones who got four, six, five, three without any prompt. So you're that you're in that bracket of the few. You might be in the huge group who actually needed a prompt and now you're enlightened. And you may still be in the group who go, oh, I can't quite see this. What's the story here? So let's have a look on. Where are we now? Right now, where have we reached so far in this? So the ID would be, imagine you're a squad. You're not participating in a webinar. You're a squad. But you're still having this particular puzzle to solve. So you're a squad. What would be happening? A few of you, like I said, would have solved the puzzle without any prompts. You'd have gotten it right at the start. You're those candidates that are there picking up things really, really quickly. The big group would get it after seeing the number grid and seeing that you match that in. You match those numbers into those shapes and now it makes sense. Still, a few could be struggling. But if you were in a, in a situation with a squad, discussion would then help. Discussion would solve the problem. You could discuss it with them. You could send them away, discuss it with peers, etc. And in that situation, after a while, everybody would be better equipped. So, so far, we're talking about the value of prompts to help not just answers, prompts, not just looking for the first two or three players to get an acknowledgement from them. How can we get everybody? And one of the ways you can get everybody is through discussion. And peer discussion is really good. 
somebody else chatting with them to say, this is how it works, this is how it works. And sometimes the language they use to each other is better than the language you use as a, let's say an expert, somebody who's, well, a lot of experience. You might, it's adult speak you're using, they could have a different way of, of using it. They could just have a better way of getting the message across to their peers. So, discussion. Do the players get to practice discussion? And you might think this man's lost it here, right? Let's get to drills and games, et cetera, et cetera. I thought we were doing challenges. You'll get there. But discussion, do you get, do players get to practice discussion? So if I went to a session and I said, um, do you do much discussion? Would the players get to discuss? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when was the last time you discussed? Well, we're sort of, we have much time for discussion now because we're moving towards championship here. And uh, could be tight. There's another 14 team that are learning. So you're thinking discussion is just a wee thing that you, somewhere out there in the ether. It's a bit like bilateral skills. If you ask so many people do bilateral skills or they do left, left hand, right hand, they'll go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then if you were able to really be a fly on the wall, you'd find out that they do bilateral skills about once every eight, nine, ten sessions. That's really not doing bilateral skills. So the same thing with discussion. If you want players to discuss, you've got to give them opportunities to discuss and take ownership. So we're down to this. Do the coaching methods that we use allow for this type of learning or discussion and learning through discussion and learning from prompts? Do the coaching methods. Now, if you said, if I left you with that slide there, you'd think again, bit woolly, Philip. We need a bit more meat to this whole thing. So let's see what we can do here. So we'll throw this. Have a look at this complicated diagram. For some of you, it might give you, you might get sort of shortness of breath here if you think you're going back to your math days and Venn diagrams if you weren't a mathematician at school. Others just love it. So have a look at this particular thing and we'll fill in the various bits and pieces for C, A, and D. So a type of coaching method, command. So all the C's in there are command. Have a look at what I've written about command. Look at the instructions, rules, who does the feedback, who makes the adjustments. So command coaching, as I would call it, is you're doing it all. Now, the first thing I've got to tell you in this slide is do not leave this webinar saying, do you know what that boy said? He said, command, you get rid of command. You don't do this. You, you got to get rid of command. No more strict instructions, no stringent rules. Don't be feedback yourself. Help get the players in all the time. I did not say that. There is a rule in there all the time for command where you are the leader and they just follow. There's always a rule somewhere in that. If we take it to the far end from command, we'll go to... Jumping on me. We'll have to go back here. There you go. Um, delegate. So have a read at delegate. If you delegate things, look where the instructions are now. Look what happens with the play. Who does the feedback? Who's doing the adjustments? You're doing nothing. So delegate is you're literally standing back. You can listen in, but you're not giving any advice one way or another. And the middle of the road one, in between C and D, the A for assist, look what happens here. Suggested instructions where you might step in there. Discretionary rules, again, what are discretionary rules? We'll see in a minute. Feedback is invited from players, so you want that feedback. You're assisting, and adjustments are sort of between you and them. So you've got these three, and if you look, they can stand alone. You could have them in a particular exercise where you do them, just one of them, etc. You may do them without even thinking, or you could have a situation where you've just put everything together in a session beautifully and you've got C, A, and D all in there somewhere, all in somewhere. So again, if I'm faced with that, if I'm at a course and I'm faced with that and nothing else, I'd be going, well, come on, Philip, examples. I live by examples, so I want examples here. So let's see, let's see what comes of this. So a command coaching example. I'll just run this down and you can read the whole thing. 
and then I'll go through it. Okay, I'm reading the bullet points. So I'm the coach and I'm in command. So I've decided we're playing a two touch game. And after we play for a while, five or six minutes, we take a break. I give the feedback on what way it's going. And my concern is too much lateral play. We're going left and right. We're not going forward enough. So my answer to that is we're going to stick with the two touch rule and we're going to add a new rule of the ball must be played forward. And we resume the game. Now, this slide, it does not matter one bit whether you agree with a two-touch game or whether you agree with the ball being played forward or you can pick holes in that. <clears throat> That's not the point. The point is that we're looking at a command example where you are doing everything in that particular game. And there's nothing wrong with that. They're just following instructions and you're adding things in to make them think. But if command dominates our sessions all the way through, or 90% of it is, or 80% of it is, we've got to think, could we put in there, could something different in there? So let's look at the other end of the scale. Delegate, in other words, this is the one we are expecting, right? We do nothing. So let's see what comes of this. We'll go down through this bit by bit. Two teams, play. No restrictions. You ref it. Just play. Just play. You stop after six, seven minutes. Take that break to get something to drink and away they go. Team one, they're chatting. And this is what they've come up with. Too many scores. We need to change the marker on the danger player. Tony Scullion is not hacking it at cornerback. And we're going to change him and we're going to put Kieran McKeever in. He loved that, right? So we've got a change the marker on the danger player. And they have come up with this themselves. They have come up with this themselves. They're under 13, they're under 14, or whatever. And the other side of it is team two, you're winning. Their feedback is here, we're going all right here. Now, we'll get the ball quicker into forwards because they're causing damage. Get the ball quicker into forwards. So your delegate coaching example there is you can listen into this, you're not giving any advice, but they're allow you're allowing them to come up with different things. Now, you've got to allow for the fact that if they're learning how to do delegated work, if they're learning to do that, they'll come up with silly things. They'll come up with things that you never thought of and you think, oh my God, this thing's going to take an awful turn for the worse. That does not matter. It's all part of learning. You can help steer them later on, but you're giving them this example. It doesn't mean you land down to a session and you run an hour session with the whole thing delegated. That'd be stupid. So you're possibly trying to fit in something in one of your games or drills, or whatever. Assist. So I'm giving you examples this time. I'm not going to stick to one game. I want to give you examples of, of assists, some of which will be familiar to you and some not. And the assists will be examples of looking at one player does this or two players you might ask to do this or a team you might ask to do this. So let's look at the one player and, and take a classic. So there's your classic example. Have a read. So you have a persistent solo runner. Somebody who just loves the ball. Could be good. Very often solo runners are good. They, they can solo, right? But sometimes our response to that is, right, whoa, whoa, two-touch. Here we go, two-touch. So everybody gets the two-touch. Whereas in this situation, you suggest a maximum of two solo runs to this player in the game and he or she decides when and where to use these. You decide. A, a quick aside from all this. About six weeks ago, I went to uh, an adult game, an adult uh, senior, a senior game, not in my own county, not involved in my own club. Um, and a player playing half forwards soloed everywhere. I mean, everywhere. And I would say out of every four times he did it, one worked and three just ended with the ball being turned over. Now, I couldn't hear what was coming from the line. It was too far from it. It was in a stand. But my biggest problem was every time he got the ball, 
the spectators, the supporters, all shared it to him, take him on, take him on. And I was thinking, you watching the same game I am. So you do get these players and you do get these, not even parents, supporters, who regardless of what's happening out there, think they've got a great soul on or go take him on because they remember the day he scored and he did. He, he put this thing on the roof of the net. You don't remember the 15 other times he didn't. So in this situation, you're given a wee bit of ownership to the player to say, look, you pick and choose. You know what sometimes happens? They don't solo. They're always looking for that really good example or a good time to do it, and they pass. So you take the break. Feedback happens between the coach, the player that you put this discretionary rule on, and teammates. Maybe somebody says, yeah, passing is fantastic. So Philip, you know, see when you don't solo, of your, your passing is fabulous. So that's one example for a one player. Here's a two player one. You ask two inside forwards to experiment, try it out with out to end runs. And you got, well, got to make sure they know what out to end runs are as in start outside, run in and make all the mistakes, make all the mistakes, go in too early, go in the same, running the same line, get in the way, etc. Those are all learning situations. And again, you break feedback. What do players think? What do the players themselves think? What do you think? Adjust if needed. And you might have to, you might have to do that several times over several weeks, just with wee bits and pieces of them trying these out to end to see do they get better and better bit by bit. So if somebody said to you, oh, this lad at, uh, at under 12 or under 14, he, he, his running was always from in to out. And any time he came from out to in, he was always in the way. He was in there far too early. But then you saw him at 18. 16 or 18, and you realize this guy has got the knack now. Well, then, did you contribute to that bit of learning where over a period of time, he's just bit by bit learned to time the run better? Could be. And finally, on assist coaching examples, a team. So you take a team and you say to them, look, see in this game, we're playing seven minutes here. Look for as many opportunities as possible to switch the play. They understand what switch the play is. You check that out. You don't check that just two players know what you're talking about and the rest are going frowns. And you make sure they know that this is going to involve the ball player who, when he or she gets the ball, is going to be taking a quick look to see, is that switch on? May not be. And teammates who, when somebody gets the ball, know, how can I make that switch possible? Now that doesn't, if you take that to the nth degree, it looks silly because then every time, if you let a, a, a player go, I want every ball play to switch the play. That's crazy, crazy. And I'm not, I'm not being, just making a disparaging remark here, but I, I do remember times when, say, we were doing things on a, on a workshop at one stage, and I'll take you back to Over the River. So the game Over the River. The game Over the River which I'm not going to explain now, but you have, you're bound to have played at some stage. That game over the river is only useful when you're playing with a number of different footballs. To play it with one football, it is the most boring game in the world. It is amazing how many coaches read the rules and then went with one football and people just lost the will to live. It's a three, four football thing, frantic. And I'm saying the same about this. If you ask a team to go for it, look for opportunities to switch the play, and they think, switch the play, switch the play, switch, and you think that, that's not helping. It's opportunities. Is it on? Is it not? Let's learn slowly here. So we've now had a look at our three particular things in CAD coaching. So, so far, if you go back to the start, we're looking at the value of prompts, the value of discussion, and then should we change in any way our type of coaching or coaching method to really draw these discussion opportunities out? And it's like CAD coaching would be like, right, let's say, let's say it was your dinner and for years and years you took plenty of salt, right? You, you were salt, salt, salt. And then you're asked to, that's, that's the command bit. Then you're asked to pull back on the salt, pull back on the salt, add a bit of pepper. Put a bit of pepper instead. 
So there's your assist. Put a bit of chili in instead, something like that. So you're given a different flavor to a session. You're not just dominated with command. And sometimes the best way to do this is set out a session and then see, how can I deliver that? Could I throw in a wee bit of this and a wee bit of that? Just experiment here and there to get the right flavor in at the right time. So the question on this would be, how are we gonna make sure that everybody gets to experience the different elements of CAD coaching without it going crazy, without every session people go, oh, you gotta do this CAD thing, you gotta do this CAD, you gotta do this command, a bit of assist, a bit of delegate. Well, one of the ways that you can do it is build them into challenges. And you're thinking, we just sat half an hour before that man mentioned challenges. So you have to build up to that. Challenges, setting challenges for players. So let's talk challenges. If you reframe something, if you always called it a problem, a problem can be grand, yep. But if you reframe it as a challenge, people sort of stand a bit taller. Will it go with a challenge? If we're told it's a problem, oh, shoulders go down. Challenge, problem. So there's a, there's a different body language to it. And they engage, they engage people. Challenges engage people. Well, let's see how we're gonna do this. So imagine you did some small set of game challenges. And if I'm doing a workshop anywhere on challenge or challenge-based coaching, I bring this. All right, don't be looking at that and, and going, oh, right, which, which, uh, this, is the, this is the gospel. This is not the gospel. This is just a thing that I did, got on an A3 and, it will. It was laminated, so we're laminated for all weathers, etc. So out we go, and you have this, and you have it at your disposal, and you're going to use it. So what happens? If we look at it a bit more closely, there's your top two lines. So these are just A one, B two, C three, etc. Whatever it was, and these are some particular things. Now again, you don't have to look at the challenges going. I don't like that challenge, I'm not sure about that, etc. It's not the actual challenges themselves, it's the act of setting challenges. So you can make up your own challenges that would suit your team. So let me just zoom in on this. So let's say we set a challenge and we decided, okay, in this game, you want to try and score from a run behind the defense. And you go over with the, the players and you chat about that. You chat about to one team, we're going to go scoring, try and run a score from behind the defence. And you make sure that people don't think, oh, every score has to be a run behind the defence. No, it doesn't. No. You can score whatever way. But could we possibly work one with a run behind the defence? And then you listen to them. And over a period of time, I've heard conversations from players aged 13, 14, 15 up, all talking things like this. So I'm going to give you these all in a row. So have a look. So you get players talking about making a sneaky run. You get players saying, you know, if you, if you want to run in behind, you've got to bring the forwards out and, and get room in behind. Who's going to hit? It's going to be a long kick pass is the best way to do this. Pretend to run out, then turn. Uh, sharp turn and go. Who'd be good at that? I mean, literally, literally choosing among themselves, you'd be good at that. You'd be good at that. Who's a good passer of the ball? And then the question that they generally turn to the coach with, what if the move isn't on? And your answer is, it isn't on. Don't use it then. Just go about your normal business. Play on. But look to see, can we make one or two of these in a game? So, what do the challenges do? They promote discussion. And they take you a wee bit more out of the equation where you're listening into this. You're maybe helping here and there, but you're getting many more situations where they get to discuss. So let's take another example. You're asking them to force two turnovers in the opposition half. Now, if we were sitting in a, in a room at the minute and we we're doing this type of thing, then I'd be asking you in a minute or two, chat among each other and say what you would do if you were part of that group who had to try and force two turnovers in the opposition half. But we'll, we'll just circumvent that. And we've got to this. So what? The conversation would be at things like this. Got to press them. 
lovely word, right? Present. Somebody would say, well, do we mark everybody in the kicker? Yeah, we're going to mark everybody in the kicker. And then someone else might be talking about, well, does it just be kicker? It's only kicker you can get a turnover from. No, 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 no. No. Um, you you lose the ball in their half. Can we win it back as soon as possible? That's that's forcing the turnover in their half, right? And then... Let's say it was, again, a workshop situation. So I've gone to a club, we're working on challenges, and this is an example of what we might do. We find out we had 22 players that were going to turn up as our demo group. So we say, create three teams, right? Two sevens and an eight. We're going to take the coaches that are there, and we're going to create three teams of management. So they go to the management. They become the management of those teams. We run a series of five to seven minute games, and this is the key. The resting team each time, so we have three teams. The resting team choose the challenge that they want. So they get that time to discuss and work out what they're going to do for this particular challenge while the other two teams are playing. And then you rotate and roll one in each time. At first, you don't give any information to the opposition. And I've seen a thing come up in a chat box there to do with, would you tell both teams? And that'll come up here in a minute. And you point out to them, score is normal. But if you've chosen, if you're choosing something off this list, then you've got to come up with some way of trying to affect that. How often can you complete the challenge? So if it's something that you think, well, if it's something like a score, a, let's say score a goal low into the corner. Well, if you've done that once and you've still you did it in the first minute, then you have five minutes, six minutes more of the game. Well then try it again if it comes up. Try another go at it. Whereas if it's something like limit the opposition to points only, well you can't say how often can you complete that challenge. You're doing it the whole way through to make sure there's no game. So you can add a twist to this whole thing. And the twist would be in those particular workshops, I'd say if we have time, we would do this. Ask a team, choose a challenge, and there's your answer. Inform the opposition. And this is the key. You must then allow them time to discuss. Because if you go, okay, team A, the yellows and the, and the greens, the yellows have chosen to do this. Greens, did you hear that? Right, let's throw the ball in. Pointless. They've got to have a time to discuss how do we counter that? How are we going to counter that? And then you play. And you could do something like that. Award five bonus points to the team that achieves this target. So it could be score a goal low into the corner and the opposition knows we can't let them score goals. Particularly ones low into the corner. So let's let's keep them further out. Let's make sure they don't get a chance to get in behind us, etc. And at the end of the game, whatever the score is, five bonus points go to the team that stopped that or five bonus points go to the team that actually scored the goal into the corner. You don't double it up into 10 if they get two goals into the corner or 15. becomes ridiculous then. So it would be bonus points. Now, to finish, to finish, your question may very well be, what about our own sessions? How are you going to fit this in? You're talking about going and doing these workshops, but how do we fit it into our own sessions? And if you wanted to build challenges into your weekly training to promote discussion, well, all I'm going to do is throw you up a diagram there and you have a wee look here. Just have a wee look at this diagram. I'll talk about it in a minute. So, a session that lasts right about an hour. 10 minute warm up. You go into small set of games. You've got your squad and you split it into two small set of games, and they're playing 5v5 in one group, 6v6 in another group, whatever it is. And you swap over, and it runs about 15 minutes. And you can have your you can have your constraints set, whatever way you want. It has nothing to do with challenges, nothing to do with CAD, whatever. And then what I might call, for want of a better expression, minis. In other words, making sure that you do some uh, work opposition work that's got 1v1s or 2v2s or 2v1s very often that people shouldn't practice whatever rather than unopposed work right depending on on the experience as well but as much opposed work as possible 
And then you think about adding once a week a 15-minute slot for challenges. You just add it in. It becomes part of your session. So in that, when you're coming to challenges, instead of having four teams or two teams, you go three teams to have the resting team and you roll them around to give them a chance to discuss. There's your answer to actually pushing discussion up the chart to work on over a period of time. And then you finish with your game. Now, that's not, uh, again, a gospel way of doing things. That's a possible way of doing things. So let me just go back to this title here. What about our own sessions? I'm just leaving that sitting there at the moment. So think about it here. We're, we're on the finish line. The value of prompts, prompt your players, let them prompt each other. The huge value of discussion and giving time for discussion, particularly peer-to-peer -peer discussion because they talk in their own language. The CAD one of looking at how much of you, you're coaching this command. Have you integrated anything like assist or delegate into it? The idea of using challenges to promote that discussion among players and with coaches and letting conversations grow and grow over a long period of time. So, I'll flick through this bit here and that's me. Thank you. Right, coaches. Um, brilliant, Philip. Brilliant. Now, there was, uh, you picked up that question there, Philip, and you've dealt with it. Now, I, any of you coaches now can unmute yourselves. I have, uh, I and I have now. You're in a situation now. You can uh, unmute yourself if you want to come in to ask Philip a question, or if you want to put uh, a comment into the chat box there. Form. This is your chance, coaches. Uh, I see Robert uh, saying there. Great session. And there's going to be a few questions for Philip here before we finish. We're in good time here. We're just uh, not even a quarter past eight. Any questions? I'll pull up your hand, raise your hand, and I can unmute you. But you, you all can unmute yourselves here now if you want to, to chat to Philip directly. Anybody, anybody want to come in and ask Philip a question? Look, Tony, Hello. Sometimes, I mean, the other side as well is, is uh, if you don't want to ask a question and you think, look, I've had enough, then by all means, just click off and go. You know, if there's somebody wants to ask something, that's grand. That's grand. Well, no. no, that's that's. Uh, and by the way, coaches, you might have noticed I posted the wee feedback sheet there. So please, 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 before you log off, it'll only take you a minute. Fill in that wee feedback sheet and submit it, please. And it's good for for us planning for for next year's CTP program. Uh, just before we finish, we had a consistent over 170 right through the session. And I think that says a lot for the session. I think we started with 174 and it didn't go below 170 right through the session. I think that says a lot. And I see by the by, by your comments coming in here, uh, you all enjoyed the session here. So that's brilliant. So does anybody the last chance here? Because you know we'll we'll call it a day if everybody seems to be happy. Uh, I will I will more than likely We'll get the session out to you. So give me a few days. There's somebody with a hand up. Sorry. Give me a second there and I'll get you in here. Yeah. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, Ray. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I just had a question there, just in general, and uh, not just about Philip's presentation, but the previous one, uh, I, di I didn't uh, get to it. Um, is that available also on the YouTube channel? The one Yes. The if you go into the OCJ, if you go into the J YouTube channel, that session of Eamon Devlin's is already up. From last week, uh, oh, yeah, so yeah. so you'll get that on the OCJ. If you have any issues with that way, come back to me, email me directly, and I'll get it to you. But it is on OCJ YouTube channel. Great stuff, thanks, and thanks for the Damien. Yeah, Damien, do you want to come on there? Yeah, I stuck it in there um, in the chat, but um, I've been critic criticised in the past for having a stop-start nature to training whenever we've been maybe playing small-sided games we take a break asking lads what was their observations any learnings etc and then you know we get going again after a couple of minutes because lads just want to you know time's tight and they just want to 
continue training and train hard and uh, and work at it. So they maybe don't see the value of that discussion piece or that learning element. Um, just wondering if you had any suggestions on on that or ways to to counter. I think the, yeah, one of the one of the biggest problems is, and I'm not saying it's you, Damien, or anything like it. It's just what we think is a couple of minutes isn't really a couple of minutes. In a lot of situations, whenever you start talking to players, it's very easily running into five minutes. So you really need to cut down and think whenever they come off, uh, if they're coming off for a rest after it, there's no problem with a five minute rest. And in the middle of it, you're discussing what they're going to do next. There's no problem with that. You're only slotting it in once in a week or once in a session. But the biggest thing is that I see is Quite a few coaches stop play for certain things and then they think they're given instructions or some examples or discussion for about 30 seconds or a minute and it's actually three or four minutes too long. So you really need to have your idea made up before they come off about what you're going to do. So, for example, did you see the one where I put up, uh, say, the one to do with um, command? And that was you set up a two uh, a game that was two touch, etc., and then you brought them in. They had a break, so when they're drinking and they stop, your instructions are literally what you can get in in thirty seconds. So the practice is for the coach to get as short and short and succinct stuff in as quickly as possible, but just focus on one thing. Focus on one thing. Decide. Oh, there's three things in my head here. I want to say, but you can literally go away and say, "Okay, lads." We're in a situation now where too much lateral play. You don't have to say more than that. You don't have to go, they're moving from side to side, and Joe, you did this, and Joe, and you were moving, and we did this. Too much lateral play. All we're going to do now is we'll stick with two, but two touch, but we're going to go, every ball goes forward. Everybody got it? Let's go. Just a couple of, we're going to go through these very quickly, Philip. There's been a number of questions come in, and we'll just go through them very, very quickly. Well, and, and maybe you've already discussed it, so I, I, I might have missed it. Would you break the groups down and would you break the sorry, would you break the down, groups down and to small groups when discussing when discussing? You can do that, yeah, absolutely. Uh, during the challenge se section of thinning, would you stop the session and give comments or let them work it out themselves for, for all the 14 teams or whatever? No comments, let them work it out themselves. The idea isn't for them to get it right at under 14. The idea is for them to develop conversations and discussion and then be well used to it by the time they're 16 or 18. That's the learning stretch. It's amazing how many times we sort of look for things straight away. And it's uh, I'm guilty of it too. We love to see things working straight away. But that's not real learning. It's That's just what they call a performance indicator. They're doing it now, but if you said nothing next week, they wouldn't do it again because they'd forgotten it. That's uh -huh. it really in long-term memory. So, okay. develop, well, oh, go ahead. Uh, at on the age, how would you handle mix the body? Would you put teams into their level or mix it up? i tell you what uh, I find works best, and this is just personally, that in any session, you have both. So there are times when you'll want certain players together to work together and there are times when you can just mix the whole thing up no bother you can mix it up right so uh, right. if somebody comes along and asks you well, why, why are you spitting that you know why why are they not all working together that's an a group and that's a b group etc i mean years and years and years ago i don't know how many 30 years ago whatever um we started before go games were on in south Derry in particular i remember this we started abc's now, there was a nearly a furore at the start about ABCs. Oh, you've labeled people as Cs. What they very quickly realized was, listen, every player will get to play the whole time. The parents don't determine where they play or who they play for. The coach will one way or another. But what, you can, what we can guarantee you is we'll play like with like from time to time here. And every time we play like with like, the coaching that goes into that group will be as good, if not better, than it goes into some of the top groups. So they weren't ah. shepherded away out of the way. But in the same session, then you have other exercises where it's mixed. It's mixed. Right. There's one from all here, Philip. If you have persist persistently quiet players, 
who still do not who still do not feel confident to engage in discussion and discussion and struggle to understand what would you do philip same same players consistently leading the discussions well what you do in that circumstance and i know i have i well saying i've done it but my, my son has done it michael has done it quite a bit was literally link players Literally link players. It's like the classroom situation. We used to run a thing in a classroom called three, two, one, zeros. And they were people who were really confident were uh, deciding that their score was three. The people who weren't confident were zeros. They were giving themselves a zero. They were giving themselves a zero as in their, where their confidence was. And we matched them. And we just got them to work together. So you had literally got a mentor as such. The other way to do it is you don't target them as such, but you, you literally go and check their understanding with what would be like a closed question. So the closed question would be something like, if I was finishing that and I knew you had a persistently quiet player or whatever, I would just have one of the coaches or me going over to them and saying, okay, Joe, Philip, do you, uh, what do you think here? Are we doing this or this? So he has a straight choice. And even though they, they end up maybe one of the choices he's never going to pick. So... Are we working on two touch or are we allowed, uh, everybody's allowed to solo the ball? Which do you think? And he goes, two touch. Yeah. Well, he's got his affirmation then. You haven't asked him, what are we working on here? You've given him two answers. And I think sometimes we ask for things that are just far too willy and too open instead of giving options for players to get a bit of confidence. Last, Brigham Philip, last couple of questions. Uh, great session. Would you use those same challenges for every age group or would you tailor it differently depending on age groups? You can, you can change it, surely, absolutely. People can invent their own challenges. They don't have to follow the ones that I have there. But I have used those particular challenges with, and I'm not kidding you now, this is no joking, and if people think I'm making this up, but the Dublin club knows the Dublin club I'm talking about. I'm not going to highlight them. Under 11 girls... Under 11 and a half girls, now they had a superb team, played some of those challenges and under 12 boys at that same club. Now, I'm not saying, oh, that's what you have to go for. But the same challenges were played in another Dublin club or a lead club or whatever it was, or in Ulster, anywhere in Ulster. They were played by under 17s. They put a different slant on it themselves. So they just use different language. So if I say, if I say, I want you to get a player in behind for a score, well, 17s will discuss that differently than 12s will, but they'll still discuss it. Right. Somebody's making a lot of noise in the background. Just a couple of, Stephen here, two left. Do you think one hour is enough time for a training session at on age as some teams seem to be creeping out to 90 minutes? Yes. If you do, I'm still a great believer in quality rather than quantity. And I think people lose the run themselves about how much stuff there is. And I don't think they do it for show. I honestly don't think they do it for show. Some some coaches would think, oh, that's just, they want to be seen to do this, that, and that. They don't. They just mismanage the time or they underestimate the time it takes for changing over from one thing to another. There's a great exercise. Of, I'm going to finish with this bit from that. There's a great exercise that people have done in other sports where they've said, right, design a session for an hour and you have the full pitch. And then the, the tutor comes back in and says, after about five minutes when the people are designing the session for an hour with full pitch, oh, sorry, we've just heard that the under 14s are coming to use half the pitch. You now have half the pitch. Redesign that session. And then you find out, you come back again, you say, oh, sorry, we've got to drop things. We've only got 40 minutes. And people always adapt, but they have to learn to adapt of those particular things. So I think an hour is fine, even less. There's one, Connor. I think you've answered the question. That's our, this is our last one. Sorry, Philip. I think you've answered it. What I find usually is you have the strongest two or three players always talking when you leave them chat and breaks for themselves. Would you see worth while in prompting or identifying certain quieter guys to speak prior to entering breaks and huddles? Um sometimes works but not very often i'll tell you what works even better what somebody else suggested earlier on groups so you literally take a group of your what i call your get take your generals together and keep your generals together for a group for discussion if they want to discuss discuss 
and take your infantry to the side in small groups. And you see when they're in like with like, and they're in with a wee quiet one, then you'll find out that they speak. Philip, brilliant. Coaches, brilliant. Thank you so much. Great, great session. Uh, could you please, 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 before you log off, fill in that wee feedback sheet and submit it. Thank you so much, coaches. And uh, hopefully you all have a happy Christmas and hopefully see you in the new year. And thanks again to Philip Care. Absolutely superb. Thank you, coaches.